Attention passengers, welcome aboard the Dub Talk Express, your premier transportation to the stars. The stars of voice acting, that is. <laughs> Tickets, please. My, my, that's a fancy looking ticket you've got there, son. In fact, this will take you to just about anywhere you wish to go. Of course, this comes with a few rules and regulations to follow. Firstly, the Dub Talk Express may contain language that is not suitable for younger passengers. Keep this in mind when traveling with young ones across the galaxy. Secondly, passengers will be exposed to spoilers for Night on the Galactic Railroad and possibly any other animation discussed during this trip. Be warned if something you haven't finished yet is mentioned. Third, the opinions expressed by the conductors of this fine express are the opinions of them alone and do not necessarily reflect the railroad and its affiliates. And finally, if you see anything strange outside the train, like giant glowing crucifixes, sinking ocean liners, scorpion constellations, or even your best friend being taken away by the infinite void, fear not. This is all normal here on this journey to the stars. All aboard! All aboard! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Boongo Stray Dogs episode. Yes, we may have already talked about the show before and wanted to talk about the movies, but we decided, eh, to heck with it. We're going to do another episode all about Megan's favorite show, Boongo Stray Dogs. <laughs> Noah wasn't wait, even wait, on that, those first two episodes, so hell yeah. Oh, oh, welcome oh. to the cult. Here is your uh, dictionary of Japanese authors, and uh, I now need you to pick your canon male, ex uh, uh, male ship. Uh... So, are you going to be a, uh, a Kudagawa, an Optishu shipper, or a Dazai and Chuya shipper? I, I apologize, actually. I'm sorry, <laughs> Megan. As much fun as that sounds, I'm being handed a memo, actually, uh, from the railroad. Uh, it's telling me that we are not talking about Bungo Stray Dogs. Uh, we you are know how to read? Uh, no, no, actually, I don't. I just, uh, I'm very good at guessing what's actually written on the page. Um, it, it's weird how I've gotten through my whole life with that skill, isn't Noah, it? Noah, are you just able to, like, do you just have, like, a skill that lets you get telepathy from trains? Are you, in fact, a real-life Thomas the Tank Engine character? Choo-choo, motherfucker. But, no, we're not actually going to talk about Boongo Stray Dog, but we are going to talk about someone who shows up in that show, actually, or, more specifically, an adaptation of his works. Yes, this is another Dub Talk retro episode. It's been a while, but we have decided that we're going to dust off the old, old dubs for those of you who may have missed them. Yes, for everyone who's stuck in the simul dub era, clashing over what is the greatest adaptation of modern dubs and trying to get over the Crunchyroll Awards thing. We were saying, ah, to heck with all that. We're going to talk about something from the older days. So maybe you can find something, a hidden gem, as it were, that you have never heard of before. Joining me for this flight, uh, my name is Noah Clue. Uh, for this ride, I should say, I've got my good Holy shit, Megan the here. trains are flying. Holy they, shit. I, mean, <laughs> I should have said flight, you're right, because they are. They are just flying through outer space. Holy shit, Amtrak has really upped its game. So, Megan, does that mean that we're actually finally covering something by Leiji Matsumoto tonight? Sadly, no, not this time. Though I do own all three uh, Galaxy Railway 999 films. <laughs> and I've oh, never yeah. watched any of them. They're pretty good. I think I, I like them. I, I think they're pretty good. But uh, I, honestly, we probably wouldn't even have Galaxy Express 3.9 or any of the Lazyverse if not for this one adaptation. Yes, back in 1927, a very, very impoverished Kenji Miyazawa in Japan wrote a little children's book, little small children's story about a flying train that takes two young kids on an adventure. And it turns out that the metaphor for the whole thing is dealing with the concept of death and creating happiness for all those around us. That, of course, is the story Night on the Galactic Railroad. And this version has, has cats. So technically, Damn. it's an anime about being on a train to purgatory. <laughs> I wasn't even going to mention that part. I, I was going to wait off on that because that is such a fun thing to reveal to people. I mean, they can probably see on the artwork on the screen, but yes... The key selling point of this movie is not the existential dilemma, is not the adaptation of a beloved children's book author. It is the fact that the characters were animated to look like cats. 
yes, just bipedal cats. Like, you thought that The Cat Returns was the first movie to do that? Hardly. Night on the Galactic Railroad from 1985 was doing that long before Ghibli got around to it. It, it depends. Do you, want your, do you want your furry awakening to be, like, semi-happy, or would you like to learn about the Titanic? Let's see. With uh, James Cameron's uh, fascination with, uh, you know, blue cat people in Avatar, if he had just had that revelation a couple of decades earlier, we could have had Titanic with cat people. That, that could have totally been a thing. Sadly, that is uh, not something we're going to get in this lifetime. But uh, we are going to talk about the movie adaptation of Night on the Galactic Railroad. So in 1985, they make a movie version of it. It does pretty well. It's actually a pretty big hit for uh, Japan at the time. It does not come out in America at that time period, though. However... Uh, about 15 years later, in 2001, we were lucky enough for the fine folks at Central Park Media to dub it into English. This is how you know this this dub is old. We gotta we, we gotta pour one out here. We gotta explain this here. Central Park Media doesn't exist anymore, do they, Megan? Nope. No, they crashed and burned. Um, I want to say like back in the late 2000s was kind of when they shuttered um, and stopped existing anymore. They, they were a a pretty prominent New York dubbing studio, along with uh, NYAB Post. Um, probably best known for um, some not very good adaptations. Like, uh, probably the most popular thing they ever did was the adaptation of Grave of the Fireflies. Uh, we're picking something that it might not be as old as some of the other dubs that we've covered. This isn't as old as Panda and the Magic Serpent, or A Thousand and One Nights, or like the old Sanrio movies from the 80s, but it's still pretty old. I'd say like uh, almost 25 years old is pretty seasoned and something that most people probably haven't seen yet. There was a time, there was a point in time where Noah, where this movie like just wasn't streaming because streaming wasn't as big as it is now. Noah quite literally would buy us copies for Christmas. It was such a good movie too. And, and, yeah, I should probably explain the story behind that. Like why, why this one? Why of all the things we've been covering for an episode, are we covering Night on the Galactic Railroad? Um, Cause I didn't find this organically. This was not something that I was around for when it was first released. It's not something that just like came on my radar. There's a very specific reason why I'm aware of this movie. Uh, so I'm going to put a picture of this character up on the screen here. This character of Zanelli who's in the movie. And this smug, shit-eating cat grin that uh, became a bit of a reaction meme in our small any Twitter circle, specifically by this motherfucker. Yes, this Twitter guy called Mexican Anime, and I'm calling you out and I'm going to tag you when this episode goes live. Uh, whenever I would post something on Twitter in like uh, being upset or agitated about something, Mex would respond with this image. This just tr cat troll pick of an image. And it was like, I don't know what this is from, and it's starting to piss me off that he constantly uses it. So finally, uh, come like 2016, uh, Mex was very nice enough to actually give me a copy of the movie because Discotech had re-released it after it had gone out of print. And I watched it, and I quite liked it. Um, I no longer felt agitated at the reaction image. There's a lot to really like about this movie, which I'm sure we'll get into. And because it's it's not the kind of thing that's super popular, like Megan said, I have been gifting the gift of Night on the Galactic Railroad to friends and relatives whenever I get the chance to. Yep. And this has been going for like 10 plus years. It, quite, quite a while. So it's high time like, that we finally sat down and we talked I about I think the I was one of the people who but got that given to them. Oh, I'm sure it was, because I had to, I had to share it with you. I was like, I need to give Megan the gift of uh, I, Kenji Miyazawa. I'm pretty sure it is on my shelf, but I need to go grab it. Hold on a second. I need to see something about my copy. I'll be right back. That's cool. That's I mean, like, five seconds to run over my book, my anime shelf. All right. We'll, we'll play some uh, hold music here. Okay, I did not get the fun autograph on this movie like my boyfriend has, so... Oh, I'll put that image up here, too. Because, yeah, I know I gave a copy to Patrick, and he got... Um, the signature uh, was signed by uh, Mike Tool. See, that's... Uh, I also have Mike Tool's on there, and it just says Megan, you rock, but Patrick says, like, this is a movie about death. Mike Tool. It's so <laughs> It's because it's accurate. That's absolutely what it's about. I'm going to yeah, whip you... this out when I see anybody on the cast for this movie at a con. Like, I'm just going to straight up pull this out and be like, be amazed. That's what I did. Um, I actually have a signature on it from one of the cast members, and we'll, we'll cover it when we get to that. 
But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely not the kind of thing you normally hear talked about. Um, mostly because it doesn't look like anime for most people. Like, most people don't think talking cat creatures when they think anime. Especially not from the 80s. So this is a unique beast of a movie. Um, I should probably explain what the movie is actually about, shouldn't I? Yeah, you should. So, uh, Night on the Galactic Railroad is about Giovanni, who's a young kid who's going through a bit of a rough time in life. His dad is off, uh, presumably in trouble with the law, um, so he's at home with his mom, who's rather sick. So he's had to grow up a bit sooner than he would, uh, most kids his age would need to. Like, he has to actually work for money, he has to take care of his mom, and he can't really have friendships as much as the other kids in the school. Luckily, he has one close friend, that is his friend Campanella, who uh, is the one person who he can really connect to. Uh, one night, during the night of the Centaurus Festival, the two of them inexplicably find themselves on a train going through space. Yes, this is the titular Galactic Railroad, and it is tra transporting people. We're not quite sure where at first, but throughout their travels, well, we mentioned um, the Galaxy Express 3.9 earlier. It's a bit like that in that they see lots of fantastical places from an archaeological dig to a giant ticking clock out in the middle of nowhere to, as Megan mentioned before, a the rather famous sinking ship. Ah, uh, yes, Purgatory Titanic. There seems to be a running theme in the places that they visit and the people that they encounter. Oh, yeah, that... there's also this weird field where this old man just captures really pretty birds and, like, magically puts them into bags. And they become candy. He just yeah. turns them into candy. It's just weird. It's the whole movie is full of some very... It, it's not, like, surreal, like, yellow submarine kind of imagery. Like, it's actually kind of the inverse of that. Because whereas yellow submarine was, like, bright and surreal, Night on the Galactic Railroad is kind of... It's dark, both imagery and tone-wise. And the, the... It makes you think. I'm gonna it's say that... It's very somber. The whole description of it is so rooted in trying to find happiness for others and coping with the rather cruel world that you're sometimes dealt. The hand of fate is not always kind to you. It also has one yeah. of the best synthesized scores ever made. I love the soundtrack for this movie. If you can find it, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, you can find just a, a whole playlist of the songs. It Please listen to it by itself. It is so good. And with that being said, uh, yeah, they decided to give this an English dub and release it in America. Um, so get ready for your retro goggles because we're actually going to go back in time. We're going to talk about some names that we don't usually cover on this podcast. Not because we don't want to, but just because their names don't get brought up in modern anime dubs very often. So, Megan, I think what we're going to do for this is I'm just going to run through the whole cast. Yeah, there, there's like, yeah. yeah, there's like no point in like breaking this up into groups because it's like only like... I'll be real, a majority of the performances in this movie are carried by Giovanni and Campanella's actors. Mm-hmm. And everybody else just kind of comes in and out. And there's actually a lot of stretches where there is just no dialogue. Even more so in the Japanese, because as we'll get into, they uh, they seem to fill the those quiet moments from the Japanese. They fill them with, like, breathing gasp sounds a lot because they, they didn't like those long, drawn-out silences. Mm-hmm. But he... Even so, we, yeah, we should definitely give a, a hat nod to the, the actors who do fill out the cast list in here. I'm going to start out with uh, talking about the ADR director, uh, scriptwriter, and then we'll get into the characters. All right, mm -hmm. so um, Central Park Media, the ADR direction on this is by a man named Erlen Tarlovsky. Now, if you have seen anything that he's done or has been the director of before, um, Megan, have you seen uh, an OVA called Animation Runner Kurumi? No, I have not. It's by the same guy who directed the original Fruits Basket, um, Akatiro Daichi. Oh, um, it's, oh it, boy. I mean, it, it, yeah, I know he's problematic nowadays, but it, it's like it's a lot like Kodacha, or a lot like his goofier um, slapstick animation. So I, I'd recommend it for that. Uh, Arlen directed the dub for that. Uh, he did a lot of other OVAs for uh, Central Park Media, too, like uh, the original RG Veda and the Geo Breeders OVAs. I'm going to be listing a lot of names of titles that I don't think either of us have actually seen before, but I'll try to mention when we may have actually heard of them before. Then getting into the script writing, um, there's actually two credited script writers for this. The first one is Neil Nadelman. 
Now, I mention him because he is credited as a scriptwriter, but most of his job uh, in not just Central Park Media, but in all of his work in anime has been as a translator. If you look at his ANN page, his <laughs> credits are mostly translating a lot of stuff, even into the modern era. Uh, the only things that other things besides this movie that he's been a script adapter for has been uh, the Harlock spinoff Maytel Legend and the aforementioned RG Veda. Got ya. But as far as like actual script adaptation names you would recognize, you ever heard of this guy called Crispin Freeman? I don't know, but he should get out of my bedroom. <laughs> yes, no ween references. We're going to mention that every chance we get. Get out of my bedroom, Crispin Freeman. Stop yelling at me, Crispin! Where did they go to? I believe they went to the Waffle House. <laughs> I'm going to have my way with the both of you, and then I'm going to do the <laughs> do dog. Do the dog, too. <laughs> That's because... the man we're trusting the adaptation of this. Because you're Lo you're Crispin Freeman, and I'm Yuri Lowenthal, and apparently you're in my bedroom again. And in scientific terms, you get fucked yes, shot, shot, son. son. <laughs> Thank you, dear rah rah rah. Best bloopers <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah, most people think of Crispin Freeman as a uh, as an actor, and he is. He's a very good actor, but he has dipped his toes into script script adaptations before. Yes, um, he, he 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 very much attempted to salvage that Utena dub. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we can really say he did that. Uh, I guess we can give him credit for trying. He's the one that actually told them that it was gay. So but yes, he did. That. No! They thought they I mean, were such good friends. It was so subtle. Yeah, it's Yo, about... Move... It, it, listen, Utena is about as subtle as... Okay, look. If you do not think Utena is gay as shit, I'm going to ask you to give me your driver's license because you're fucking blind. There was a lot of delusions in the 90s. A lot of people just w would not admit it. Utena, and... Utena, Utena is as gay as it is painful to get hit by a truck and set into an isekai. I mean, I Very. wouldn't recommend wouldn't recommend that people watch the dub of that mo that show. Uh, honestly, yeah. somewhere out there, Brainchild is like sneezing because we're talking about the Utena dub without her. We'll get. I'm sure one day we'll get around to that if we can find the time to marathon the whole thing in the movie because it, it yeah. is well worth the dissection. But yeah, on top of adapting that, uh, Crispin Freeman's done a handful of things. Like he wrote the scripts for His and Her Circumstances, uh, Bookie Pop Phantom, and he, not only he was the script adapter, but he was also the director for the dub of I My Me Strawberry Eggs. That's a pr that's that a, that's gave a me one. psychic damage. <laughs> Have you seen it? I I remember it. I've, ah, good. It's terrible. You can, you can remember it, so I don't have to. <laughs> Ding dong. Well, well, we're we're gonna get to better discussions. Of, we'll give compliments to Crispin Freeman in a minute. Um, now, as far as getting into the cast here, like Megan was saying, um, it's a mostly episodic movie of characters kind of coming in and out of the characters' lives. So I'll start at the bottom of the list and kind of work our way up as far as prominence. Uh, first up, I'm going to give a shout out to Mr. Pete Zarostika, which is actually a pseudonym for Oliver Winman, who is not only the bird catcher, but also plays the cat shit eating grin character Zanelli himself. Zanelli did everything wrong. Considering how the movie ends, you know, uh, w w uh, I'm not going to spoil it yet. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but yes, Zanelli actually did do everything wrong. Uh, who did... Uh, Pete, however, uh, what has he done before? Um, he has been in a handful of things around the world. Uh, he played Morty in the 2001 Shaman King's dub. He played... Um, okay, uh, Megan, did you watch Yu-Gi-Oh! GX? I did. Oh, boy. Well, good. Uh, was there a character named Aster Phoenix in that show? I, I don't know how much of... Yu-Gi-Oh! I watched. Yes, well, there was. Because... There was a character named Aster Phoenix. Nightmare. Oh, good, because Pete played that character as well. Um, it, basically, he, yeah, he's been um, in and out of uh, quite a few dubs from, from the like uh, late 90s, early 2000 era. Ah. And, and he's in this dub. Who else is in this dub that you may know from uh, late 90s, early 2000s anime is Eric Stewart. Who plays the lighthouse keeper? You were um, close. <laughs> I don't know. Do I even need to mention what Eric Stewart's been in before? You should, for some people who don't remember, don't have a childhood. 
I, I'm not gonna say they didn't have a childhood. They just may not have been children in the the time that Pokemon was around. Okay, listen. If you are above, if you are Andrew's age and above, please listen to the <laughs> next five seconds. I mean, yeah. The most prominent thing that Eric Stewart's known for, at least to our age group, is he was both Brock and James from the OG Pokemon, the old old one. Leo uh, Fournette and, and four kids of part. the devil. <laughs> Yeah, that's what he does. Uh, he, he's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't even know if I have to listen to anything else. Because actually, I don't think I've seen any of the other things that he's been in. Just uh, when I wrote down his credits here, I haven't seen him in anything else. So th I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> don't worry, you, a hand, you little blue head. It's lavender. Moving on. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that I can remember the greatness of Pokemon. I'm glad you met. I'm glad you mentioned that, because we're going to... Hold on to that. Hold on to that Pokemon knowledge. We're going to get to that a little bit more in a minute. Now, there is a teacher character that the characters have. Um, is both in the classroom setting at the beginning of the movie, and also reappears on the Galactic Railroad as a professor who is uh, digging up uh, the old skeleton of, like, an ancestral cow or something like that. And he is played by Greg Wolf. Uh, Greg Wolf, uh, you may have heard in such amazing OVAs as Maze. He was male Maze in that. Uh, you may have heard him in, as a Kunimitsu in INA's High Kick, which is an OVA I have on my shelf because they were selling it for a dollar at my used video store. Uh, the only thing that people would probably actually recognize, like people still watch nowadays, is Record of Lotus War. He played the character of Gim in that series. Now moving on past that, uh, there is also a young man who shows up in the aforementioned Titanic scene. And he is uh, played by an actor named Gil Ramesey. And unfortunately, he has not done a whole lot of anime work. He has had a couple of speaking roles in shows like Shingu, Secret of the Stellar Wars, and Marmalade Boy. And a brief role in the video game The Last Remnant. So this movie may actually be the most prominent thing that we will hear Gil in. Moving up the list, we're going to talk. We're also going to talk about the two human characters that we run across in this movie, and those are um, okay. They're two human children who are also on the Titanic, and they're not named in the movie itself, but they're named in the credits. So I'll go ahead and name them off. Uh, the girl is named Kaoru, and the boy is named Tadashi. How the fuck did the Japanese kids get up on the Titanic? That's the question. That's the billion-dollar question. What the fuck, movie? Characters. We got lead characters with like Italian names who are supposed to be in Japan, but now we got Japanese named characters on the very British Titanic. I don't I know. I mean, what the heck it's is like it's not like there weren't not white people, but if they were like, oh my god, I have to Google this now. Well, I mean, they mentioned in the movie that their dad was like traveling for business, and it's like, wouldn't he have been taking the Pacific Ocean? I. I Maybe we're overthinking that a little too much there. I don't think these were actually based on, like, real real passengers aboard the Titanic. Okay. There's at least one person I could find that, sur uh, that could survive the Titanic. One Japanese person. I don't think that's what the... I, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's what this was... The, I don't think that's what Miyazawa was going for. Kenji Miyazawa was going for. I know, but still... You know what? We'll put that as our headcanon. How about that? Okay. They are the representation of the one Japanese person who survived the, the Titanic. Uh, a boat where uh, not many people survived. Uh, voicing those two characters, though, uh, Kaoru is played by Lisa Ortez, and Tadashi is voiced by Amy Birnbaum. Now, Lisa Ortez is probably a name that uh, even modern viewers would probably recognize. Um, Megan, if I say Lisa Ortez, what comes to your mind? Uh... Hold on a second, I have to do this. Uh, uh, what's, I don't remember what her attack is. Dragon save! There we go, that's, there we go. The one and only Lena Inverse from the Slayers. <laughs> I had to Google that because I've never watched Slayers. I wouldn't blame you, honestly. Not because I think that people don't need to watch it anymore. Because I do think it should still be watched nowadays. It's that you can't watch it anywhere. At least not in America. It's like Discotech, ridiculously hard please. to get hold of her. Just, yes, please. I know, I know that Enoki deal or whatever it was fell through. But come on, Discotech. You can work your magic. But yeah, so Lisa's in this. Um, 
yeah, Lisa's been, actually, Lisa's been in quite a few things. Um, she's like La La Rue in Now and Then, Here and There. She voiced the, um, she's actually still voicing things in today's dubs. Like, if you're watching the show, uh, that time I got reincarnated as a slime, she voices the character of Frey in that show. I think she was, I think she was also in a My Hero season. Everyone has been in a My Hero season. You know what? Shut Wishbone is in My Hero. Shut the fuck up, Noah. And the answer is yes, yeah, she plays Burninin. Is that in season six? Yeah, she's um she's uh one of the sidekicks that works at, uh for Endeavor. Okay. Because I I gotta be honest, I haven't watched past season five. It's okay. <laughs> she I'm sorry. She's also flaming in that show. <laughs> oh, perfect. Excellent. Um now Amy Burnbaum, who voices Tadashi, um this is very interesting to mention because while she has not had as many anime credit roles, um, the most prominent thing that you may have heard her in is that she voices the character of Max in three of the Pokemon movies. Uh, she voices Max in Jirachi Wishmaker, Destiny Deoxys, and uh, Lucario and the Mystery of Mew. Uh, what I know her most for is actually... Uh, Megan, did you ever have computer games when you were younger based on the I Spy books? I think I was a jumpstart kid. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, we can still get along. We can still have fun. Um, I Spy made a lot of uh, computer games, um, and it, they had voiceover in them, and they were actually kind of fun because, you know, they were like point-and-click games where you're supposed to find the missing things throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I bring that up is because Amy was a voice in that, but she was also the ADR director and producer for a lot of those games. Oh. So, you know, that... Peak 90s right there. See, my peak 90s computer adventure game was uh, uh, Carmen San Diego, the Amtrak Adventure. <laughs> that's not the version I thought you were going to go with. I, that's the one I haven't played. Is that's the, the one I own. That's the only one I had. Really? You didn't have like... Uh, no, I only had Amtrak adventure. adventure. You didn't have Math Adventure. You had Amtrak Adventure. Interesting. So I have to ask then, did, did you watch the Netflix Carmen San Diego adaptation? I have not because I don't watch anything. Okay. That isn't anime or playing Final Fantasy. Um, you know what? I can't... It's not the it's not the best adaptation of Carmen Sandiego, but it's got a lot of Easter eggs to, like, other adaptations. So I was going to ask you if uh, if they had put in a reference to the Amtrak game in there, because I wasn't looking for it when I watched it. No idea. I don't know. Well, anyways, now that we're talking about Amtrak, which is a train, and we're going to get back on the Galactic Railroad, segue... Let's mention our last two, and by far the most important members of the cast here. So, the two characters who are riding the Galactic Railroad are Campanella, voiced by Crispin Freeman! <laughs> and his and Giovanni, voiced by Veronica Taylor! Now, <laughs> So, Ash and Alucard ride a train and learn about death. Oh, you've, you've heard of Ash before. Yeah, I, I, in uh, Veronica's credits, I just wrote, uh, she voices Ash in that, that Pal World ripoff that came off in, came out in the 90s. No, I, you I were going to get us before. doxxed. <laughs> I'm just so happy that, that, that Pal World was allowed to exist and was not eliminated off the face of the earth by the sheer force of Nintendo in an instant. Nintendo doesn't care about that. I suppose not, because they're not as vindictive, apparently, as the Disney Corporation is. If this was a Disney they're situation... They're, they no, they're surprised. vindictive in another way. You know, that's a rabbit hole I actually do not want to get down this night, because we're going to try to keep this light, happy, and talking about death. But I'm glad that you mentioned... Yeah, Welcome yeah, you mentioned to a Christmas show Freeman about Alfred. death. So yeah, Veronica Taylor voices Ash in Pokemon. Uh, she, I was actually... I'm glad to go through her cast list to find that not only has she done a lot more than just Pokemon, but she's also still doing stuff. Like, um, one of the more recent things is she voices Sailor Pluto in, uh, the Viz redub of Sailor Moon. And, uh, tying it back around to something else that Crispin wrote for, uh, she voices the main character of Yukino in Karekano, or His and Her Circumstances, which is the second best thing that Gynex ever made. I was about to say, I was literally about to say, I was like... Okay, do you also do this sometimes where you forget that Kare Kano and Koikaze are different shows? No. No, I don't forget that because they are nothing alike. No, but my brain sometimes confuses them. I mean, I guess I can forgive that, like, getting the names. They're close, so maybe get mixed around. 
but for me those two are so different from each other that I never read the name Karikano and accidentally think of Koikaze. That's if never we get to, to one, if we if this episode gets to ten thousand views, I will watch Koikaze. Wait, don't we have a rule that all of our episodes have to be about something that's like readily available? I never said we were going to do an episode on it. I just said I'd watch it. Oh, oh, well, I mean, I that mean, should be okay. An episode, no, then. if if somehow between this coming out and this time next year, like as of the date that like this episode comes out. If, like, mm -hmm. fucking Discotech gets Koi Kaze again, no one, I won't review it. <laughs> Considering what they've released, which is, like, run the gambit between, oh my god, this is amazing, to, oh my god, how does this exist, there's a 50% chance that Koi Kaze will be on that re-release schedule. Anyway. And for rounding it off, of course, I don't even have to list what Crispin Freeman has been in, because he's been in everything. Uh, like you said, he's Alucard in, uh, uh... Why am I blank? You got Helsing. He's El Cardin Helsing. Sorry, I was going to say Castlevania for a second. And I'm like, stop. That is not the right franchise. Uh, he's uh, Zelos in uh, Slayers. He's the guy with the tuxedo in Dura Ra Ra. He voices the um, sparky oh, guy in Spectacular Spider Man. Oh shit, and I actually forgot. I forgot what that guy's name was in, in Dura Ra Ra. Because I know Johnny Bosch's character's name. That's Isaiah. But I don't remember the blonde one, and he was basically like Chuya. That was like the Chuya and Dazai of like the early two thousands. Totally, sh I, I'm, I'm holding the DVDs now too, and like, well, yes, that was incredibly gay. But I'm like, what was his name? And damn it, the credits don't actually tell me oh, who it was. Oh shit! <laughs> uh, uh, quick, Google blonde guy do ra 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 name. <laughs> and they say Shizuo. Okay, there we go. My Shizuo, my, fu my Fujoshi credit is only mildly intact. <laughs> I feel bad too because they say his name a lot. They're like, "Who do you think is the most badass guy in Akapura City?" And they're like, "Shizuo." Anyways, Shizuo yeah. so and his eye is like Inuyasha Kagome for 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 women who want to see two men fuck. Um, but th but they never do. No. <laughs> Not, not canonically. Not canonically, but... <laughs> you know what? No, given that given that that's written by uh, uh, Ryoko Naruto, I wouldn't be surprised if in this day and age they would, he would have written them fucking. Probably, yeah. If, the, if those novels would come out just even five years later, probably. Well, without co covering the cast list here, um, so I just want to freeball this entire discussion about this movie. We don't even have to, like, go through the different stops that they make along the way. Um... So I just want to know, Megan, like, what did you think of this movie and its adaptation? So, okay, so I have to explain that the first time I watched this movie was a couple of years ago with my friends for my birthday, and I don't think they liked it. <laughs> so, like, this is my first time watching it since then, like, just by myself, and, like, I remember everything that's coming. And I'm like, for the most part, I'm actually surprised with how well this movie's mix has actually held up over, like, 23 years at this point. Uh, given that one, it was an adapt, it was taking at the time. This movie is like forty years old at this point. Yes, it is. The original movie is definitely forty years old at this point. And they only made a dub for this movie when it was like twenty years old. And I have to imagine that the technology for dubbing back then, with this old M and E track, wasn't that great. So like. I don't think I ever want this show, this movie, to get like a redub or anything to either be oh, like no. more faithful or like better produced because I think that it is an interesting time capsule. Um, yeah, I think that the writing is pretty straightforward. There's nothing that feels really out of like whack or out of sync. It's a movie yeah, that's based totally on ambiance. Oh, it's vibes. The movie, absolutely. Yeah. So, like, you will either groove with this movie instantaneously, or you will think that this is nearly two hours of absolute hell boredom. I do think that you're right about the- you gotta be in the right mood, you gotta be in the right headspace to enjoy this. And every time that I've, like, sat back to watch this, it's always been, like, a late at night I want something to calm down and fall asleep to, because that is absolutely the ambiance of this movie, including the audio track. Yeah. The- yeah, the really good M and E that you're talking about, and how they're able to add in uh, English dialogue really well, probably comes from the fact that the the Japanese director Gisaburo Sugi was actually someone who came from audio mixing and sound editing more so than animation direction. So a lot oh, of the ambiance it, it, of the it, movie it yeah. shows. Yeah, because yeah, 
for the most part, like, this movie does have some very striking visual moments. Uh, the hair, the heron catching scene, uh, the Southern Cross station scene, the absolutely wackadoo Titanic scene. Um, the water's like flooding into the train and spotlights everywhere and like, crashing and... I genuinely cannot describe to people how fucking out of nowhere the Titanic part comes from. That's true, because it's like, yeah, the, the breakdown is, just trying to explain it, is uh, characters walk onto the train, they take a seat, young man starts explaining why they're there, and then smash cut to, it's like the crashing of the Titanic is happening outside of the train windows, and all of a sudden, like, the imagery starts bleeding into the characters' train, and it's so it's very evocative it's it's not only the visuals it's the it's the vocals of that moment too which i'll talk about in a minute um but i think the thing that really works the best about this is that it is a very limited cast and but they got the best two actors for the lead characters like i'm not gonna lie you're gonna go in there and you will immediately tell that this is veronica taylor being being uh giovanni yeah like there's no hiding that it is veronica taylor because at that point in time i don't think that the the switch had happened for uh where veronica and them were taken off because of the, a lot of the really bad behind the scenes stuff with pokemon where it would eventually go that ash becomes uh, sarah nanectity mm -hmm. um so at that point in time like it's like 2001 when this dub comes out it is probably like the height of pokemania like you're not going to watch this movie and not go like, okay, that is just Veronica Taylor's Ash voice. But it's so I, much different because it's Veronica Taylor, like, getting to actually do a lot of really weird emotive stuff and, like, come to grips with the fact that, like, he's going to become a martyr for the legacy of his dead best friend. I mean, I can't imagine, like, the overlap between person who was a big Pokemaniac and also wanted to watch this talking cat movie about death and morality. Yeah, like, I'm gonna be real. Like, if you sat a child down to watch this movie, they probably hated it unless they were not with kids. I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, uh, Leo has actually... Uh, he, he saw that I was watching this movie uh, a couple of months ago, I think. And then he uh, asked, can I watch that talking cat movie again? And the two of us, we just kind of... We sat down and we vibed to it and he, he was kind of struck by the visuals of it and something that was not frenetic energy all the time, like con uh, constantly bombarding you. It, it wasn't the Mario movie is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, and like I this is that... not a child. This, this is not at least the traditional like Western Hollywood kids movie. It's definitely a movie made for a, a, for kids of an era where they were okay with there being somber and subtlety in movies because we definitely we were allowed to have that, especially hi. in Japanese movies back in the time period. Hi, kid. Speaking of cats, my cat has come over and said hi to me. I was ho I'm was glad. I'm so glad because we weren't going to have this recording without having a cat jump into the recording. Hi, Shinya. <laughs> and I mean, like, also be like, uh, we've got to talk about at least where this movie comes from is that this was a movie based off of a children's book by Kenji Miyazawa, and that book was from, if I'm correct, like, the late 1920s? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, he um, was writing it. Uh, he was writing it not only in a time where um, Japan was... They, they weren't prospering. Like, there were a lot of backwood, uh, backwoods country folk who were dying of tuberculosis and not living very we're, long lives. We're also getting to the point where a lot of their, like... This is going to be the weird thing. This is where the disclaimer comes in, that thing we're talking about. Uh, I need people to understand, especially in a lot of today's discussion about anime and how it's viewed, is that, surprise, Japan is not an apolitical country. And it is not that far off from the fact that they were a nationalistic, imperialist government that was going around and forcing themselves and invading places like china and korea and they were doing very awful things in china and korea and some of the writers of that era were either against it or for it but in the case of kenji miyazawa to infer a little bit about his life and what he puts into his work and this has to be said because this movie does deal with religion at one point is that kenji miyazawa was a devote buddhist yes 
He was a devout Buddhist. He was actually a specific devout Buddhist that was different from his father's devout Buddhism, which caused them to fight. He was also, Kenji Miyazawa also came from a farming background and was an agricultural teacher at one point, as Mm -hmm. well as being a poet and a a author. Um, And and for the record, for anybody who wants to know what his Boongo Stray Dogs character is, his character, it, it's based off it, not Night on the Galactic Railroad of all things. It's actually uh, being hot defeated by the rain, which powers him up well, as long as he's not hungry. Yeah, because he could, he not only himself kind of um, uh, forced himself to live in an era of uh, uh, poverty and not living prosperously, but he surrounded himself by people who were sim- similarly living that way and didn't have the advantage of daddy's money to bail him out like he could have gone into the family business he could have followed his dad's and his parents's original uh branch of buddhism and probably lived a much more prosperous life but it didn't vibe with him like he was absolutely drawn to the sensualness of the real folk and the suffering that they were going through which ties a lot into this movie because a lot of the characters discussions of this movie is about happiness is what's causing happiness for those around us and going back to that religious thing you were talking about there's a scene uh where the the characters who get off of the southern cross are like talking about their religion which is get off the train go to heaven that is their happiness yeah the big cross big shining cross uh but the buddhists like caponella and giovanni are saying like no our job in life is to actually do right for the people around us to make earth as heaven like as possible and that dialogue is carried over into the adaptation with the uh the characters rejecting the heaven and actually going to the coal sack which leads to the grand finale of the movie which is sad and death filled yes uh because there's this one really weird there's this like i guess i'm gonna get uh kind of like i what i'll say this I think Crispin and them did a great job adapting the script for this because it is very dialogue heavy and it is very adulty. But I don't ever feel like the directing ever made the kids not sound like kids. But that being said, speaking uh... of Christian Jesus, <laughs> um, I got to talk about Christian. I got to talk about Gil Ramsey as the tutor. Oh yes, and do so. there is this just absolutely bone chilling part of this movie, where if you realize what you're, he's talking about, he is quite literally talking about basically like subjecting his own religion onto these two children, because it's Which like they- I could have I could have pushed them onto the boats. I could have saved them, but I saw but- them. But I have to save them in the true way. And that is letting these two fucking kids die and sending them to Christian heaven. (laughs) Well, the good little children go to heaven. And And you're just like sitting there like, what the fuck is wrong with you, my guy? But no one on the train like condemns him for that. Like there's another cat character on the train who's like, I think you made the right choice, basically. Yeah, and it's just like, it, 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 I mean, and that, that's fair on them. But then you know, I'm sitting here as like an as like an ex Catholic going, "What the fuck?" Um, <laughs> true, like true happiness. Because true happiness not- is true happiness is letting two kids, two kids hear the crack and watch the man hit the propeller as he goes off. Um, <laughs> James Cameron sat there and went, "Dude, what the hell?" Um. But I think that, like, that's kind of only, like, the real part where you really hear Gil as this young man. And then it's, like, the it's time to go when they get to the yeah. station. And God bless Amy as Tadashi going, but I don't want to get off the train. And then they just, like, knowingly <laughs> stare at him and guilt his ass off. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? Just st- the, the movie's almost over. You got to get off eventually. You could have gone to Buddhist heaven. There, There's no... what It just said... It's not like it's just, like, pussy only there, but... Well, I mean, a lot of the cat characters do get off at Christian Heaven. and uh, What's that song they're singing? It's like, Hail's Messiah or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they're just singing like, like hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, it's all very somber and it's like, okay. And their little, like, and their little, like, cloaks going <laughs> into the light and they all look like the little Virgin Marys. One of these days, I need to show you um, Will Vinton, you know, the claymation guy? Oh, yeah. He made... He made an adaptation of uh, The Adventures of Mark Twain, and one of the stories they adapted was um, uh, Captain Stormfield, where basically it argues that a man's got to be in heaven, but he's got to be in, like, the right heaven because a character goes to, like, 
a weird ass alien heaven that's not his heaven. Ah uh, shit, I went to the wrong heaven and ended up in the one from Hasbin Hotel. That's basically what it is. You are so close that it's not even funny. <laughs> ah shit, I'm stepping in Hasbin Hotel. Regardless, yeah, I'm glad you pointed out Gil's uh, performance in there. I was almost, like, not going to put him on the cast list of things to talk about, because I'm like, wait, does he even have a big speaking role? But you're And then, like, he, and then he talks about fucking killing children on the Titanic. He, he, yeah, he goes through the same, uh, I don't want them to suffer. And the suffering he's talking about is, like, being separated from your parents. It's like, well, if they're dead, they'll be together in heaven. Their dad was already in America. What do you think that man felt like? Yeah, yeah, we didn't really discuss the implications of that. But, you know, the, they're already dead, so it's not like we can debate ethics anymore. Yeah, the train's Come on, kids, get off the train, never... or we're going to end up in Heaven's Lost Property. <laughs> That's another show I haven't seen, and probably never will. Uh, yep. So, the, um, let's see, what are things that are stand out for? Um, uh, let's see, the Birdcatcher. Um, now, the Birdcatcher in the Japanese was actually voiced by, um, I should have written his name down, but he's like a, a really prominent older actor. And if you listen to the Japanese, you can hear, like, the gravitas in his voice originally. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete's portrayal is, like, it's all right, but it's it's no match. Like, I don't feel like there's a gravity and a an, uh, sense of forebodingness in his delivery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he just makes him sound like um, a an older, more put-upon, but kind of normal-sounding guy who is just happy with his job of catching birds, burying them in the sand, and turning them into candy. I do like the music, though. I, I really like the birdcatcher theme that plays when oh, he's yeah, catching it's them so and good. throwing them in the sand. Yeah, well, yeah, like you said, the whole soundtrack is really good. There's no bad songs in this whole thing. And then um, it's just like, also, you're like dealing with, uh... I'm trying to think of other moments in there. I really liked, uh... I actually really... The birdcatcher scene... It, it's so weird, too, because it's also just a scene where it's very quiet outside of him laughing and grabbing these gorgeously animated herons and mm -hmm. shoving them into the bag. And then on and then on the on the train, Professor Oak's like, isn't he so fucking happy, kids? That was very I'm sorry. That was so out of place. And I don't know why they let Eric Stewart uh, talk like that. It's just like, OK, that's Professor Oak. Bye, Professor Oak. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah. uh, also, can we talk, I guess we can, it's time to shit talk Zanelli. Oh, oh, that's right, he also voices Zanelli. Yeah, fuck you Zanelli. You before that the dub doesn't make the kids not sound like kids, you were saying? I disagree. Um, oh no, I said they do sound like kids. In the dub? D yeah, kinda, depends on the kid. I mean, I'm directly comparing it to the Japanese. Um, if you listen to that classroom scene in the Japanese, like, the voices are... Uh, like Zanelli in particular, uh, it's a higher, squeakier voice. Um, it's like a very like. It was probably an actual child actor. It might. It probably was, and it, it's it very much matches his. Um, Didn't you hear that Capanella or sorry Giovanni's dad got he got in trouble for an illegal stealing, and they threw him in jail like a common criminal. But uh, Pete makes his Zanelli sound more lower and. Uh, honestly, older sounding. I, so, I genuinely bet. thought by all of the screen cats of Smug Cat that they were like older cats, but then it's like, nope, they're kids. Yeah, yeah like the characters are supposed to be like, uh, I feel like they're supposed to be like eight or ten. Yeah, and like Veronica and Crispin sound like kids, but. And maybe I mean, some of the uh, other kids. Veronica at least does. Yeah, Veronica. Yeah, Crispin sounds more like a teenager. Um, like, I never got the sense that his uh, voice was supposed to be that of a 10 year old i i always thought it was supposed to be a little older sounding yeah and like zanelli the, the zanelli did a lot wrong like he's spreading rumors about uh poor poor but giovanni giovanni's yeah yeah and it was his fault that campanella dies because he so, didn't listen to yeah. anybody but they said don't get too close to the river yeah, let, let's go ahead and break that ice here. Yeah, the reason why Campanella is on the train in the first place is because he died in the river saving Zanelli. Because uh, if you fall in the river at night, uh, you're probably not going to survive. Yeah, because uh, the current the, goes too fast. But, like, yeah. if you're if you're an eagle-eyed watcher, you can tell that the train is probably death early on. Because when... Uh, Campanella gets on the train, you can see him wringing out his coat, and there's water. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Giovanni even says, oh, it looks like you have dew on you. Right. Meanwhile, Giovanni gets on the train because he fell asleep on the hill and was just thinking. Yeah. And they, uh, all the whole train ride, Capanella's dialogue is talking about he feels bad that what he did is going to make his mother sad. Because he's, it's all about true happiness. And although, yes, he saved the life of a classmate, you don't think that, uh, hmm, maybe dying is going to be a real bummer for my mom. And that's what's well, weighing on his mind throughout the entire ride. I think it's, I think it's that he's disappointing her by joining her there. Because I think it's implied that his mom is dead. Now, see, I didn't quite get that. Like, we know his dad is alive. We know that, because we see his dad at the end of the movie, but I wasn't sure... If his mom was dead or not. Like, that wasn't quite clear in the dialogue. I, I think it but was you're implied, right. at least. I think you're right. I, I'm sure. that That's the thing, is, like, you do... It, there's subtlety in this, and they don't adapt the dialogue. Like, uh, Neil and Crispin's writing doesn't uh, try to make the dialogue less... or I'm sorry, try to make it more overt than it was in the original. Which I appreciate. Shouldn't you get down from there? Kinda, I shouldn't, yeah. It lets the dialogue and it lets the visuals kind of stand on their own. And that that's what grabs you the most. We don't need a giant sign uh, on the screen that's like, they are dead. This is about death. Like, we don't need that. Yeah, no, we don't need to spoon feed people like every other, every seemingly modern Western adaptation needs to do or a lot of anim... Okay, I can't say that about, like, a ton of anime dubs about making things no. more overt, but I mean, like, Western media in general... Well, I don't think there is a Western studio or anything that would make this kind of movie. Oh, um, no, 100%. This is a very Japanese movie. I mean, like, the in general way that, like, because this came out around here, around the, this, like, time of this recording, was the live action at uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, which sat and monologued a lot of things about the world and how things were, as opposed to the Avatar The Last Airbender cartoon which used a lot of uh, moments of Aang, quote-unquote, goofing off and going on these adventures to show you where the reach of fire, the Fire Nation's imperialism was. Mm-hmm. And that's what I mean by, like... And there are a lot of people who watch a lot of anime who don't like a lot of, like, mystery anime or original anime where they can't just go to an adaptation, a manga, and be like, oh, well, this is gonna happen. It's like, no, this is bad because it won't tell me all the information and is playing things close to its chest. Mm-hmm. type of moment. Well, e- I mean, even if you had read this book, even if you've read the original Night in the Galactic Railroad, I feel like the the effect that you get from watching the slow burn as the train continues through is still going to be as effective, even if you know that uh, Capanel is already dead and that it's, it's going to end with Giovanni having to say goodbye to his friend at the end. Yeah, and even as us who've watched the movie before, we know that's coming, but we still enjoy the ride getting there because that's half the point of the film is these is seeing how this is a movie that i think definitely gets better upon rewatch because you start seeing more of the subtle hints oh, yeah. of okay giovanni is dead okay this is what this film was talking about um you mean is dead campanella is dead not giovanni uh <laughs> but one of the things i really want to talk about was we haven't talked about um melissa ortiz yet yes as uh, kaoru she's she uh, the only the- other person that sounds like a child <laughs> Yeah, she does. You're right. Uh, well, I mean, no, Amy does too. Okay, like both yeah. Lisa and Amy. Yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, they're they're voicing younger characters and they're using female voices, obviously. But uh, what I love about Lisa's performance is that while she still sounds like a kid, she's actually very much a dead ringer for the original Japanese, especially in the scene talking about the scorpion. She has a whole scene where they see the scorpion constellation and uh one of the kids uh tadashi is like scorpions are bad scorpions will hurt you and attack mm-hmm. you and lisa has this really uh evocative uh story about how a scorpion didn't want to be eaten and therefore it is it ran away and it started to drown in a well that it found down but in its dying moments it's thinking oh man i'm gonna die and it's not gonna mean anything for anyone but if I had allowed myself to be consumed by the, the animal is trying to eat me, it would have given that animal life for another day. And I was really being selfish. I was being a bit of a dick by not allowing myself to be eaten. So it talks a lot about, like, the usefulness of death. Uh, like, we always talk about the loss and the severity of uh, leaving people behind. But we never really talk about, like, the necessity of like passing on nutrients to other creatures or just 
what death can mean in the big circle of things. You know, the, the circle of life. And yeah, Lisa carries that entire dialogue. Like, that's the whole reason mm -hmm. why her character really stands out is the way that she carries that with the same gravity that the original Japanese did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a shame that we don't, uh, we don't get the characters much longer because they only show up for a couple of chapters. And but, then they get uh, off and go to Christian Heaven. And they get to go to Christian Heaven. Um, although, uh, one of the other good things about Kaoru's uh, inclusion, uh, when Kaoru and Tadashi come in, is um, something we should talk about with the character of Giovanni. We see this world entirely through Giovanni's eyes. Mm -hmm. Like, nothing happens that he doesn't see. That's why we don't see Zanelli fall in the water. We don't see his mother because she's, like, in bed. We don't go directly see her. In the scene where Kaoru and Tadashi join the train... Uh, Kaoru starts talking to Campanella. They're like having discussions about magpies out the window. And because someone else is talking to Campanella that's not Giovanni, Giovanni is like really heartbroken because he wanted it just to be his, him and his buddy. And all of a sudden he's got to share that with someone else. And that whole thing, that whole sensation is conveyed by just a single shot of him looking despondent while Campanella is talking to Kaoru. Yeah, and you can only, and like the audio is faded on, I believe, Capanella and uh, Karu's voices to focus on that. And it's absolutely so, yeah. As uh, magpies turn into apples. Again, weird mental imagery that's just like, who Sim thought of this? Symbol I mean, symbolism. I don't even know if that's symbolism. I think that's just something, uh, like, I. Everything I got from the little bit of Kenji's writing, like Kenji Miyazawa's actual writing I've read, is he's got a big thing for, like, blending the real with the surreal. Um, like, uh, he made another movie called um, Gouch the Celloist, which is about a uh, celloist who uh, gets ad uh, inspiration for how to do better in playing the cello from talking animals. Um, like, yeah, Kenji Miyazawa had a thing for uh, surreality, I think. But it was the kind of surreality that was always rooted in the real world. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, now, I wanted to ask something that actually has nothing to do with the dub necessarily, but it's a, a reading of this that kind of ties back to what you we were saying before about Utena being gay. Um, do you think you could read this story uh, through a uh, gay analogy? Potentially. The... I could potentially see it through, especially like especially how Giovanni is very much keen on Campanella and how mm -hmm. Giovanni seems like the outcast of his friends. Mm -hmm. And that in the end, it is his friend that dies for someone who probably, people who probably never really cared about him. But in his death, Giovanni sees that he must sacrifice himself for the greater good of all, even if it makes him unhappy. Because it'll let him see his friend again. I don't know how much that will hold water as much as other things. Because it's like, I I, I just don't know on that one. But okay. I, I genuinely do think, like, in the end, the movie is very much about death and making the world better by making other people happy. Because in a sense, it's, but it's also kind of very weird. Um... <laughs> Where it's I mean, like the 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 like die and sacrifice so that your body burns bright over and over and will never be forgotten, but it's also making sure yeah. that like it's also weird because it's like you also don't want to like get yourself killed doing that, so it's like yeah, a weird that's... cycle. It's definitely coping. It's someone mm -hmm. uh, the writer coping with. Everyone's gonna die eventually. So let's mm -hmm. contemplate all of the good things or all of the good reasons because to consider that um, death has no meaning and that all of our deaths and our lives for that matter have no purpose to it is a very nihilistic way to view things. And I think he was trying to write in a way that made people think more positively about something that we have to deal with eventually anyway. Um, at case in point, the origin, like the genesis of this exact story was uh, Kenji Miyazawa's sister. She actually... Um, she died, and mm -hmm. that's actually a theme that comes back in a couple of his stories. Um, if you've seen... Have you seen the recent um, The Life of Gusko Bidori? No, but I own it. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty cheap at Sentai. Psst. And thank you for that, by the way, because it that's another uh, movie from the same team, from the same writer. Maybe uh, one day director. we'll cover it. 
Maybe we will, because we can talk about Derek Snow in that movie. And I love talking about Derek Snow. Yes. But uh, but in that movie, uh, that's another movie where um, uh, hard life, because uh, people are just dying a lot in the early, in the 1920s Japan, uh, including the uh, Gusko Bidori's sister also dies in that. So, uh, yeah, that was definitely a theme that was very heavy on Kenji Miyazawa's mind. Um, and we get it again here. Only it's not a sister. It's a best friend in this movie. In short, please watch more anime about Japan in the 1920s. No, not all anime is big titties and slaveys, guys. No, no. It's, it's about suffering and misery and poverty and hunger. And you know what? Maybe... Uh, it's not so bad that we suffer all after all, because uh, you might get to ride on a train to the Galactic Railroad. Ride the train, not suplex the train. Absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes spiritual trains get suplexed. I still can't believe that uh, March Comes In Like a Lion had a reference to this at the very end of its first season. You know, I'm not surprised. <laughs> this gets I mean, referenced I a lot. <laughs> That's true, it does. It even got referenced in um, Penguin Drum, like the first couple episodes of the Penguin Drum, where characters reading the story of Night on the Galactic Railroad. Rail I Road. think also, B, there's like quite literally like a, a thing about like the scorpion. In, uh, in what? In um, uh, Penguin Drum. But, like, I'm going to Wikipedia for this. So this is other anime that may have may or may not reference that in the Galactic Railroad. We obviously oh. have the Galaxy Express 999. Uh, the yeah, character uh, Shaman King. Uh, looking up at the Half Moon. Yakitate Japan. I haven't seen that. Aria. Aria has a reference. Uh, oh, that Penguin Drum. Me. Yeah, the, the main character... Yeah, Penguin Drum with the scorpion fire motif and the apples. The uh, apples, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that shows up a lot in Penguin Drum. Uh, Giovanni's the Island. And now that one, I, was, I wasn't sure if that one was a deliberate reference or if it was just because Giovanni is a fun name. Um, no, the protagonist names are coming from uh, Giovanni and Campanella. Like, Bacchano oh. has a reference to it. Really? I didn't yeah, catch there's, that. It's in the novels. Oh, well, that explains There's a character that. named I, uh, Monica Campanella. I'm really bad at uh, reading manga and light novel source materials, it's all folks. Good. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, this has been uh, a very. Uh, apparently, very apparently, Over the Garden Wall is a reference to this. I'm not surprised. In fact, I'm glad. I've forgotten while I was re watching that in October. I was like. This has a lot of Night on the Galactic Railroad feel to it. Because it's about two characters who uh, wander off into, you know, episodic mystery world that feels like an analogy for the real world. And then it turns out that a large part of it is covering loss and moving on from that. So, yeah, I'm not surprised about that. Patrick McHale is a is a great guy. And I, I really wish we had gotten to see his Red Wall adaptation. That would have been great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, and talking about this, um, we talked about a lot of good things on this. Um, and you're right. There's not really anything in the adaptation as far as, like, writing and direction, aside from maybe the age sounds of the characters, mm -hmm. that strays from the original. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to give them a lot of hat tip for this. In an era in the early 2000s where televised anime dubs were, like, the thing that people were really looking for, and... Uh, home video releases of sleazy OVAs that would get the attention of horny 12-year-old boys. I am glad that something like this was not only allowed to get an adaptation and get released, but a fairly faithful one, too, that can still be enjoyed nowadays. Uh, you're right, Megan. I cannot imagine this getting the Grave of the Fireplace treatment where it gets redubbed. And Please don't ever redub enough. this. No, I, I don't think anyone will. I, I don't think there's demand for I that. I cannot but imagine what was. the m &E track looks for this fucker. Oh, I no, I can't. I can't match what it looks like. But no, this is definitely something that I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it. It's an evocative movie with a great cast, a great sounding score, and yeah, I you people need to hear this. I think we just covered this because we wanted to encourage people to check to it out. To watch the movie, yeah. Like I'll be real, like I think the dub is really it's actually pretty good for uh its time pay its time phase. Uh the early two thousands in anime dubs I think were still a very wild, wild west. 
Uh, and this, I believe, came out probably, like, just after the Great Cowboy Bebop Renaissance. Renaissance, mm -hmm. or, like, right around it. But... Yeah, it was definitely in that same... That but same that was a lot of, of... releases. That was more California, but not New York. Though a lot of people that were in this would eventually... Uh, some of them would eventually go over to California and, you know, become some of the most well-respected voice actors of the modern age. Um, yeah, this is like this is like fifty percent people we've heard of and people that never really fell off the map. Yeah, of, never of voice really acting, came which is back. Fine. Yeah. And I think that the dub holds up fairly well. I think that the movie is great. It's one of those like you should at least see it once to like say you've seen it. It's definitely not a movie that's going to jive with a lot of people because, unfortunately, uh, this is not the anime's fault. I just think it's the way that anime has become talked about um i don't think that a a movie like this would even even if they produced it today even if this was mm -hmm. because kenji miyazawa is such an influential writer in japanese history because let's be real like one of the hottest anime out of the last like six ten like five six seven eight years is boon goes for dogs um, which has obviously encouraged a lot of people to go back and look at this, slash, fuck with every literary person's Google Drive, like, fate has fucked with the history majors, um, <laughs> but- I am so happy. I love it when an anime name surplants the actual thing in Google search images. That is great. Um- JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a godsend. But, like, um, the thing is that even if this movie was made today, I think a lot of people would, like, snub their nose at it. Not because it, it because it's not flashy. It's not done by like, it's not like in your face about everything. It's not frenetic like you said, but I think that it works better because it's not all of those things. And there is a sense of I guess the best way to say it is that like the movie itself, the dub is very humble. It's a good word for it. Humble. I it's like very that. humble. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Does it have a couple of bad habits of that time and place to, you know, fill the quiet with noise? Absolutely. Yeah. But I wouldn't knock it as much as I would knock that maybe today where people, like, you know, know fucking better. Mm -hmm. Um, But that being said, hey, this movie is available streaming, like, a bunch of fucking places, so you have no excuse not to watch it. Yeah, I'll, I'll use that to segue in here. <laughs> like, we, we've talked the ear off of, this, of Night on the Galactic Railroad for an hour now, and you're probably like... Okay, you told me to watch it. Where can I do that? Where can I click to do that? Luckily, it's available in a lot of places, and all of them for free. Um, so Discotech Media re-released this movie in 2015, I want to say. They, they re um, uh, up it and put it out on a nice Blu-ray. And they also made it available in a lot of places. Like, you can watch it on Crunchyroll, uh, both sub and the uh, dub we've been talking about. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. You can watch it on Tubby. No, Tubi. Tubi. I always, Tubby! I, I don't know. Why do I always pronounce it Tubby? It's Tubi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you can watch it on Pluto TV. You can watch it on the Roku channel. I think you can even watch it on Retro Crush. It's available I in think, a lot yeah, of I places. think, yeah, I think it's on Retro Crush. Yeah, there's a lot of places where it's out there, which is good because it means that it's, it's getting a lot of exposure out there. Um, personally, I think the both of us could recommend actually picking up a physical copy of it. Discotech has kept it in print. For a good 10 years now, both, um, DVD, well, the DVD is probably out of print now, but the Blu-ray is readily available, and I highly recommend that because that version comes not only with the film in really good sounding audio, but it comes with an audio track with commentary, comes with a commentary track by Justin Savakis and Mike Toole, who do a really good job going more in-depth to the history of Kenji Miyazawa, the politics, the philosophy of this, way more in-depth than we could on this <laughs> podcast, so if you want like the full nerds encyclopedia footnotes quoted cited version of this movie buy a dvd blu-ray copy listen to that commentary mm -hmm. with that being said um we are the dub talk podcast and if you know where to find us you know where to find us but i'll tell you anyways you can subscribe to our youtube channel where we recently passed six thousand subscribers woohoo yay and we also update our episodes in audio only format if you don't want to throttle your bandwidth uh, we got places like Podbean. Um, where else do we upload them? I forget. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I, I only upload to the Podbean section. I think um, uh, Google Play, uh, Apple, 
iTunes is available. Basically, all the places where you listen to your podcast is where you can find this podcast. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for listening. And honestly, we got to give a huge shout out to the wonderful patrons who help make special episodes like this possible. Yeah, so it wasn't for you. We would not be doing special retro episodes where we go back in time and listen to what Otaku from 2001 had to listen to. Yeah. Specifically, we want to give a big thanks to our $5 patrons, Megan's mom and dad, who we thank not only for donating, but also for giving us Megan and giving her a place to live. We also want to thank Michelle Travis. Thank you very much for this. And drum roll as well for our ten dollar tier. These are the folks who donate a little bit more and get our episodes early. They get them out before anybody else and gets to enjoy being part of our Patreon raffle, where you get to pick what we cover next. Those ten dollar patrons are the amazing Anthony Brown, the charismatic Carly Lestikow, the quite amazing Kimwa Soup the magnificent Marissa Lenti, and the awe-inspiring Otaku Anthony. Thank you guys so much. We could not do this and would not enjoy doing this without your help. Hey, Megan, when you're not riding on the Galactic Railroad, where can these fine folks find you? You can find me on Twitter shitposting at Queen Era 2, uh, and I'm also running around Final Fantasy XIV, and if you know, you know. I don't know, because I, I don't know what a video game is. I didn't even know there were 14 Final Fantasies. There are... S Technically, there are... There's a lot. There's, like, at least set 16 mainline ones, but they remade 7, so... They remade 10, too, didn't they? No, 10, too. No, 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 no. No, 13. 13 had a sequel, right? Yeah, and so did 10. That's why there's 10, too. 10, 2, and 13, too. Yeah, they... I don't. I can't keep track of it. I'm sorry. I missed the boat on Final Fantasy, so I'm just never gonna be in it. One day, you you have a working computer. One day, I'll get you to do that free trial for 14. <laughs> you know what? J just for my good buddy Megan here, I, I think I'll take that plunge. Ah, yes. Anyway, um. <laughs> and you can find me uh, myself Noah Clue on Twitter at Noah Clue where uh, uh, anyone who wants to have good discussions about the wide world of animation from the present to the future and the way past too. I love talking about stuff from the way past. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, I also, for those who aren't so much into the deep discussions of animation, uh, you'll also get cute pictures of my kids and my pet Lily because when you are a domesticate, domesticated family man as myself, you put a little bit of your domesticated life on Twitter for others to enjoy. With that being said, the, the station is coming up here. Have your ticket ready. Megan, I believe it's time for us to say goodbye. So I'm going to cue up some sad music here. It's been great knowing you, but I, I got to go. I'm sorry. Okay, bye. Uh, if you need me, I'm going to uh, brace my legs and start the suplex per uh, suplex uh, position. <laughs> I'm glad we got to talk about this movie. Oh, so am I. <laughs> Otaku on. Aloha. And... The Galaxy Express 3-9 will take you on a journey, a never-ending journey, a journey to the stars. Remember, kids, lift with your knees when you're doing a suplex. Mm -hmm.